Jimmy Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Monday, September 21st, 2020. As I last left you on Friday, I had concluded the podcast, and as I exited the studio, the alarm dinger went off on my smartphone and alerted me to the news that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the senior justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, had died on Friday at the age of 87. And it was really tragic news to process and For the first time ever since I started this podcast, I recorded a little alert, a bulletin, and inserted it right at the beginning of the program. Today, after a weekend of reflection and absorbing a lot of news about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, about the politics of her succession, I have a few things to share with you. But I want to first cite uh, my colleague's comment, Linda Lewis, who said... You're facing so many horrors with so little time. And I did struggle today to put our program together, the News and Comment podcast, because there is so much going on. And uh, I do my best to compress it to what has stretched to an hour-long show. So first, let's honor RBG. She was a remarkable and in some ways phenomenal woman. And the fan base that developed around her. And yes, she knew that the notorious RBG was a takeoff on the notorious B.I.G., the rapper who came out of Brooklyn. And she was remarkably uh, connected to uh, a younger generation of people who she regularly engaged with at college, law schools, and uh, people who simply came for a tour at the Supreme Court. And there isn't too much that I can add to her life and her legacy. Only to say that I don't join the rearview mirror critics who say, well, she should have known better, she should have retired when Obama could have appointed her replacement. And that is hindsight, and you're entitled to that view. But I don't think it really makes much difference. She made her decision to stay on the court as long as she possibly could. And yes, it is quite inconvenient to face this during the year of COVID, the year of the re-election, Trump's efforts to uh, rig the election in his own manner while saying that other people are trying to take it away from him. And yes, it does give, I think, a a new, uh, a new lease on life to the Trump campaign. But a lot of people overlooked that if RBG had retired, say in 2013 or 2014, in the second Obama term, that her replacement might not be very satisfying. I mean, Merrick Garland, the guy who was stonewalled by the McConnell rule in 2016, he was half Republican. (laughs) That's why Obama chose him. He figured they can't turn down this guy because they've already voted for him in lower court confirmation hearings. So at any rate, I don't engage in that kind of uh, revisionist view Ginsburg was appointed for life, and it was her choice to serve until the end of her life. So the body of Ruth Bader Ginsburg will lie in repose at the Supreme Court on Wednesday and on Thursday. And in addition, Speaker Pelosi has announced that Ginsburg will lie in state in the National Statuary Hall in the Capitol on Friday. That's the first time a woman has received that tribute. And there will be a memorial service for Ginsburg at the Supreme Court, a private ceremony for family, friends, and the justices. And that is on Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. And after we saw the sordid reaction of Mitch McConnell and an almost human reaction from Trump on Friday, it's clear that any comments that they make about respecting Justice Ginsburg 
or her wishes uh, is bullshit, pure and simple. It's posturing. Because there was McConnell within minutes. I mean, (laughs) I, I was just recovering from the first wave of hearing the news when McConnell announced that uh, President Trump would be naming a nominee and the Senate would confirm that person before the end of this year. And at his mob rallies over the weekend, Trump acknowledged that it will be a woman, likely to be a Catholic, and that's what we need, a sixth Catholic on the U.S. Supreme Court. And Trump is now saying that, well, he won't announce the nominee to replace Ginsburg until the end of the week, out of respect for her memorial services and the honoring of her passing. But there was that moment Trump had been at a mob rally. Where was it, Minnesota? (laughs) They kind of run together. And as he was headed for his aircraft to exit, reporters shared the news that Ginsburg had died. And he said, wow, really? He said, I'm hearing this for the first time. And he managed to offer a dignified comment that wasn't political, that wasn't critical. Something to the effect that she was a great woman and she'd had a great life. And that is so rare from Trump. (laughs) He's always punching. And he decided that in this case, he would hold back. So, as you probably know from the widespread reporting in the corporate media, we have two Republican senators, women who are nominally pro-choice, Susan Collins of Maine, who is in quite a struggle to hold on to her seat, and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. Both have publicly stated they believe Ginsburg's replacement should be made by the winner of the November 3rd presidential election. Kamala Harris who will be on the Senate Judiciary Committee to grill the nominee. She said Joe Biden said it as plain speak as it possibly should be said, which is the American people will elect the president in 43 days, and whoever is elected should be making the decision about the Supreme Court of the United States. That, she said, is how it should be. So there's a lot of speculation. Mitt Romney is avoiding making a statement right now. We have a bunch of capitulators and a huge group of hypocrites, starting with Lindsey Graham, Ted Cruz, Mitch McConnell, all these people who said that the newly manufactured McConnell rule back in 2016 was that you don't fill a Supreme Court nominee in an election year. But, of course, he had many fingers crossed and all of his toes, too, because the, you know, The exceptions are, well, when we have a a Republican president and a Republican Senate, we will ignore that precedent that we manufactured to handcuff Barack Obama in his final year in office. And we will engage in raw power. And that's what we have to expect from these people. So Lindsey Graham, who had told reporters to save the tape, that he wouldn't support a nominating and confirmation process during a, he said, once the primary has gotten underway. Well, we're in the general election, 40-some days remaining. And their opportunism, their selective recall of their own statements and their own history, is just part and parcel of the current era. Trump lies every damn day, and these people figure that they ought to get up uh, and lie more often because (laughs) there is no penalty for it. And so that rank hypocrisy is lost on no one, even on Republicans. We'll get to some polling numbers here in a moment. So... There are are many scenarios here, but let me deal with a couple. One is that Trump will announce his nominee at the end of this week. Then they will try to convene the Judiciary Committee as soon as possible. And the Democrats do have some ability to slow that process down. But the candidates are likely 
to have been heavily vetted. The women that we are hearing mentioned have, uh, you know, some visibility. And so that process may not take that long. But then the decision is, do you bring this nomination to the floor before the election? Partly because you want that new justice to be there for any post-election confrontations or legal battles that are appealed up to the Supreme Court. Certainly, a fresh nominee will be quite loyal to the stable genius who nominated her. But there is also the scheme, if you will, that Republicans may be satisfied to nominate a pro-life candidate and then leave it to the lame duck session right after the election to move that confirmation process to the Senate floor. Now, there is one risk there, and that is the Senate race in Arizona. It is to select the candidate who will complete John McCain's term. And Martha McSally, who's running well behind Mark Kelly in the polls there, could lose. And if so, Kelly would be seated on the day after his election is certified. That could cost the Republicans one vote in a very tight race. And, of course, we don't know how Murkowski and Collins would vote because they have only pledged to, uh, you know, support holding the confirmation vote until after the election. Now, Murkowski does talk about, you know, that the process shouldn't begin until the next year, that the new president, whoever that is, should be able to choose. And if Biden is elected in November, even with the lame duck session, that's a big challenge for Mitch McConnell to get it over the line. Now, some of the retirees, like Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, (laughs) he's given up all shreds of decency and moderation that he once postured to hold. And Rob Portman, who's, you know, slightly less of a Neanderthal than other conservative Republicans, he's from Ohio, he's on board, he's on the, the train, the bus, to ram this nomination through. Now, one of the tactics that has been suggested for the Democrats is that Nancy Pelosi should uh, or could bring kind of instant impeachment hearings against Attorney General Bill Barr or even possibly the president again. I consider that to be pretty far-fetched. But it's within the realm of possibility, and we're going to see if the Democrats Democrats really do take it to the wall or if they're just going to kind of whine and dither and make it look like they've done everything they could. So their candidate for president, Joe Biden, urged his former Republican Senate colleagues let me rephrase that. His, <laughs> his former colleagues in the Senate who are Republicans, he said, please follow your conscience. Don't vote to confirm anyone nominated under the circumstances President Trump and Senator McConnell have created. Don't go there. Uphold your constitutional duty, your conscience. Let the people speak. Cool the flames that have been engulfing our country. We can't ignore the cherished system of checks and balances. Well, that's a lovely plea. But it falls on deaf ears. As long as Trump is their president, the members of the Senate Republican cult will not fall out of line. Now the election can change that. If enough Republicans lose and the message is clearly sent that the public, including many Republicans, do not approve of this gamesmanship, this hypocrisy, the flat-out lies... That could change the dynamic significantly. But at this point, (laughs) we really can't predict. And so we see pressure on Mitt Romney, on uh, 
Cory Gardner, who's up for re-election in Colorado. Chuck Grassley, the Iowa Republican, who had previously said that a vacancy shouldn't be filled in an election year. I don't believe we have heard his current position on the opportunism that is now presented. And while Trump is uh, saying that he's showing respect for Justice Ginsburg, he went public with a comment that was uh, chortled at by Rush Limbaugh today. And it relates to what has been presented as a, a deathbed wish from Justice Ginsburg, where her granddaughter wrote down at her direction a statement that her fervent wish is that her replacement not be named until what she called the installation of the next president. So that's the inauguration. So Trump said, I don't know that she said that. Or was that written out by Adam Schiff and Schumer and Pelosi? I would be more inclined to the second, okay, you know? That came out of the wind. It sounds so beautiful, but that sounds like a Schumer deal or maybe a Pelosi, or Shifty Schiff. So he can't maintain, you know, appropriate decorum in the face of a death of a widely respected jurist on our top court. It all just uh, devolves to name-calling, political posturing. But, of course, he claims it's the Democrats who are posturing. It's the Democrats who have politicized all this. And Rush Limbaugh repeated those talking points on his show this morning and then played a clip from his latest mob rally, North Carolina, I think, where Trump went on for two minutes saying, what a great guy Rush Limbaugh is. And not only do they trade talking points, but that kind of uh, (laughs) ass-kissing exchange is, uh, it's pretty revolting. But what's more revolting is all of this projection that it's the Democrats who are politicizing this. Because if they observed the McConnell rule and just allowed this nomination to be handled in the next administration, even if that's Trump, they wouldn't be getting this kind of uh, bitterness and uh, backbiting from the media and from the Democrats. And the media has tried to play back those clips from 2016, but these Republicans have no shame. They don't care what they said then. And, frankly, the voters that they attract don't care either. They view that as a form of heavenly deception in service of God's wish that the chosen leader, Trump, is going to end the scourge of abortion rights in this country. And I believe that most of those voters will tolerate any hypocrisy, lying, criminal behavior, uh, corner-cutting, law-breaking in their effort to achieve that goal. And so when we get to the political calculations... Will this energize more Democrats? Yeah. But will it energize even more Republicans? I'm afraid so. And as Trump was trailing, I I looked at a bunch of polls this morning, and Biden is ahead in almost every state, but, (laughs) you know, only one or two polls shows him with a double-digit lead. Many of them are close to the margin of error at 4 or 5%. And you've heard my critiques of Joe Biden as the Democratic standard bearer. He doesn't inspire. Most people see him as a vehicle to say no to Trump. He's not running on policies for the most part. And he's trying to link health care and protection of Obamacare to the Supreme Court fight. Because Democrats are afraid to fight over abortion rights. They're afraid to stand up for them. Joe Biden is a Catholic, and so he's compromised on that issue. And this is another case where they brought us this milk toast moderate candidate 
who cannot stand up in the heat of this battle. One of the other factors that I find amusing is that Republicans now believe that with the loss of Ginsburg, where we had a 5-4 split between conservatives and so-called liberals, we now have a 4-4 court. And I pointed this out a week or two ago when Rush Limbaugh was basically defining Chief Justice John Roberts as a Democrat. And so here comes Ted Cruz, senator from Texas, Friday night on the Fox News Channel. We can't have Election Day come and go with a 4-4 court. A 4-4 court that is equally divided cannot decide anything. And I think we risk a constitutional crisis if we don't have a nine-justice Supreme Court, particularly when there is such a risk of a contested election. Has he forgotten that John Roberts was part of the Brooks Brothers mob that went to Florida to stop the votes from being counted in 2000? And that's why Bush put him on the Supreme Court and then promoted him to chief justice? And the fact that Roberts cast the deciding vote to uphold Obamacare, cast the deciding vote to prevent the census from including the citizenship question, upheld a couple of other narrow decisions in this past term. When it comes to election issues, he is not going to vote with the Democrats. And so it's a 5-3 court, not a 4-4 court. And they don't really need the new justice to use the court to stop vote counts or to tip the scales in favor of Trump. So a quick Reuters poll taken over the weekend showed that a majority of Americans, 62 percent, agree that the vacancy should be filled by the winner of the November 3rd presidential election. 23 percent disagreed. The rest said they weren't sure. Eight out of 10 Democrats hold that position and five out of 10 Republicans. So that is a working majority. But we have minority rule and bare-knuckled power politics. That's the McConnell way. And that's how this is going to roll out. In Sunday's New York Times, Frank Bruni gets it right, and I don't always agree with this guy. But he describes Donald Trump as a cheater. Whether it comes to voting by mail, the downplaying of the coronavirus, the manipulation of the data, the bizarre entry of Kanye West into the presidential election on a few state ballots, his paying someone else to take his SAT test to get into Penn, to Penn. <laughs> and the list goes on and on. Trump is a cheater. But if he cheats in a manner that overturns Roe versus Wade, there are millions of Americans who will declare him their hero forever. And who cares about the Constitution, the rules, the precedents, commitments that have been made in the Senate? None of that matters because Trump doesn't care. And his core voters don't care. Now, this is really bad timing. In Sunday's New York Times, in the front section, I turned the page, and here is this full-page ad written to the leaders of the Democratic Party. And uh, I don't know how many people signed this. Oh, 109. Thank you, they tell us. And it is a notification to the Democratic leadership that many members of the many elected members of the party are pro-life. Bullet point one, we're concerned that many Democratic leaders support policies on abortion radically out of line with public opinion. And they rig and selectively interpret polls to say that uh, abortion available at any time for any reason is opposed by 79% of Americans. Well, that's because the question makes it seem like it's on the level of uh, what color jeans am I going to wear today? 
Bullet point two. We are concerned due to this wide disparity, the Democratic Party is alienating voters. They say in 389 of the 435 congressional districts, a majority of voters support a ban on abortion after 20 weeks. The Supreme Court has established that as the benchmark. So then they turn that around and say that Democrats support late-term abortion. And this is a specious and ugly argument. Then they say they're concerned about the betrayal of Democratic Party values. For this to surface at this point, where abortion is going to be re-injected into this presidential campaign with the Supreme Court vacancy issue, it's unforgivable. And the fact that I disagree with their point of view uh, to me, <laughs> is less significant than that they chose to raise it at this point in time. So as if life isn't complicated enough in the swamp, we have nine days left until September 30th when the government funding runs out. And that would lead to a technical government shutdown if a continuing resolution isn't passed. The big struggle is over whether to include somewhere between 14 and $30 billion for bailouts for farmers. And the farmers have already been bailed out to nearly that amount to keep them in line after Trump's failed trade war with China and other countries has hit them very hard. And there was a nasty storm. What's it called? Demarche or something like that? that slammed Iowa in August. But, <laughs> I'm sorry, give them disaster relief, but don't take money out of the Department of Agriculture funds that are intended for crop losses and, you know, a harvest that comes up with bupkis. So that is now the subject of struggle between Democrats and Republicans. There is no movement on new COVID relief money coming out of Washington. And if you thought we had gridlock before RBG died, we've got a whole new kind of gridlock and a brutal political struggle that's going to play out between now and the end of the year. New data shows that the Postal Service has experienced a severe decline in the rate of on-time delivery since Louis DeJoy took over. In northern Ohio, on-time delivery rates have dropped to 63%. In Detroit, 61%. In Baltimore, below 60%. And I, I still find this to be bizarre because many of Trump's voters, not as many as Democrats, but many of his voters are going to vote by mail. And he needs those votes as badly as Biden needs his own. And we know that Trump is trying to game the system by attempting to declare a victory based on the results from polling places on Election Day. When it's clear that the vote in the mail voting will not be tabulated for at least a week, if not more. He's going to be agitating, suing, tweeting, staging mob rallies, <laughs> threatening. <laughs> he will do everything to try to declare that the election is over and he has won. Now, Canadian National made a bunch of bad choices. I don't believe we have her uh, name yet, do we? No. She is described as a Canadian woman who mailed a package containing the deadly substance called ricin to the White House. And she was picked up trying to re-enter the United States from Canada near Buffalo over the weekend. She was busted for overstaying a six-month tourist visa. 
She was found with a weapon during that arrest. That was in uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Texas. So I guess her fatal flaw was she tried to use the Postal Service to deliver that package, and it was intercepted, they say, at the final off-site inspection facility before it got to the White House. Every day I pause for a minute to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. Great people like Faith Peoples, Doug Cooper, David Radcliffe, and Elizabeth Vasquez. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks for your support. And if you are prepared to chip in 5 or 10 or $20 a month, why don't you? All you have to do is stop by peterbcollins.com forward slash sign up, and the details are right there on that page. The corporate media continues to give incredibly short shrift to the extradition hearing being held in London related to the U.S. demand that Julian Assange be sent to the United States to face trial. We start with coverage from Consortium News. And by the way, if you follow the links, I link every day to Consortium News, to Shadowproof, and to Craig Murray's blog. There is a little bit of a discrepancy because Consortium News calls uh, today's hearing day 10. But Craig Murray calls it 13, and that's because there were three days of preliminary hearings early this year. So that explains the difference between the two. So Consortium focuses on the testimony of Canadian, uh, is she Canadian? Journalist Cassandra Fairbank. Uh, She testified that based on her source, Arthur Schwartz, a Trump backer and member of the inner circle, that the president himself personally ordered Julian Assange's arrest from the embassy in London in April of 2019. She learned that in October of 2018 from Schwartz, that the U.S. would have Assange taken from the embassy, that he would only be charged with the Chelsea Manning leaks and not for other issues, that the U.S. would again go after Manning to testify against Assange. And, of course, she was imprisoned for contempt for almost a year, that Richard Grinnell, then the U.S. ambassador to Germany, uh, to Germany had worked out a deal with Ecuador to hand Assange over. The order to get Assange had come directly from Trump, and the U.S. would not seek the death penalty to make extradition possible. And she also said that she was contacted by Schwartz after she came back to the U.S., who was furious because he learned of her informing Assange, evidently through the surveillance at the embassy. That will come up here shortly in a new uh, uh, expose from Max Blumenthal. They tried to get her fired from her job at the Gateway Pundit. Fairbanks has posted an audio recording of Schwartz's call. So in addition, my longtime friend, the journalist Andy Worthington, who has done more coverage of Guantanamo and the related issues than almost anyone on the planet, he was excused from testifying today because... The prosecution said they didn't have enough time to prepare cross-examination. And Joe Lauria points out that this is deeply ironic because the prosecutors have been dropping bundles of documents on the defense witnesses just hours before they're going to testify, and then they ask them questions about the stuff that they haven't had time to read. Next, we hear of the testimony of Christian Grothoff, who is a professor of computer science at Bern University in Switzerland, And he testified that Assange had been very careful about vetting the names of individuals who could be harmed if they were uh, leaked when WikiLeaks released information. There's a lot of back and forth over who released certain files, including the Iraqi war logs, first. And that continues to be a point of contention. Then, reviewing the report of Craig Murray who's actually in the public gallery at the Old Bailey in London. He describes the testimony of Nikki Hager, a New Zealand investigative journalist who wrote the book Hit and Run. Uh, And that's, of course, related to Assange. Hagar said the collateral murder video that had been served up by then Bradley Manning 
had the most profound effect throughout the world. And there's this whole effort by the prosecution to block references to the content of the collateral murder video. And this is all bizarre because the judge knows about this stuff. There's no jury. And so she keeps telling them they can't discuss the actual content of that video. And the defense has gone to great lengths to work around that position by the judge in order to get the critical information onto the record. And Beretzer has said that she's not going to determine if the U.S. had pressured Germany or if Khalid el-Masri, the victim of rendition, had been tortured. She said those are not the questions before her, and, and I do understand that. Her issue is whether Assange should be prevented from being deported or extradited to the U.S. because it is a political matter. And to me, that is extremely clear, but we have no idea what is in the mind of Judge Beretzer, who seems deeply biased. So the comments from Craig Murray, she said, we have her decision that the witnesses can only have half an hour of going through their statements before cross-examination. And this is a bizarre way of dealing with things because witnesses are required to issue a statement. Then they're only allowed to talk about that statement for 30 minutes. Then they're subject to cross-examination on the entire written statement that they issued. And this just seems fundamentally unfair. Murray says he is deeply suspicious of the technical breakdown of the video link that made El Masri's evidence in person technically impossible and that they haven't even tried to reschedule it after fixing the glitch. So, Kevin Gostola today, instead of recapping the trial, he's a day behind and he'll do that tomorrow, he put up a list of all of the media outlets that are actually covering the Assange extradition hearings. And you won't recognize any major papers like, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the L.A. Times. Nah. Anyway, it is helpful and uh, includes links to their sites. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast at goodoldpeterbcollins.com. And Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, the former president of Brazil who was imprisoned, in a wrongful conviction related to alleged corruption charges coming out of the car wash scandal. He wrote a plea to block the extradition of Julian Assange, saying he is not a criminal, he's not a spy, he is a journalist. And he says, in addition, Brazilians owe an additional debt to Assange. Files published on his WikiLeaks page revealed conversations that took place in 2009 between those who would later be in the Temer administration which in 2016 deposed the government of Dilma Rousseff and top officials in the U.S. Department of State about questions related to the privatization of Brazil's deepwater oil deposits. It was through reading the documents revealed by Assange that Brazilians learned of the relationship between the man who would later be Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Temer administration and executives in the North American oil giants ExxonMobil and Chevron. And... In essence, he's saying that that's what led to his release from prison. He's trying to get his record cleared so he can run for president of Brazil again. And we'll watch that very carefully. I mentioned that Max Blumenthal has a new investigative report over at the Gray Zone Project. And he lays out and names names about how top journalists like Ellen Nakashima of the Washington Post and former CBS 60 Minutes producer Lowell Bergman, who's now affiliated with the New York Times and PBS, that they both have known because they visited Assange at the Embassy of Ecuador. They have known about the surveillance system and spying carried out by UC Global, a Spanish-based firm, 
with ties to the CIA and to the business operations of Sheldon Adelson, Trump's top donor and the Las Vegas casino magnate. Blumenthal writes, For the past four years, the Washington press corps has howled about Trump's angry browbeating of the White House press pool. At the same time, it has reacted with a collective shrug to revelations that a firm that was, by all indications, contracted by the Trump administration's CIA to destroy Assange had spied on prominent American national security reporters. He describes how Randy Credico, who some people recall from the Roger Stone trial, that when he learned about the troubling surveillance at the embassy, because he was a friend of Assange, that he tried to shop it to all kinds of American media outlets. I went to everybody. I went to MSNBC, The Wall Street Journal, CNN, to journalists I knew, and I couldn't get anyone interested. So it's a fascinating report. I've linked to it for you to peruse at your convenience. The link is in the show file at peterbcollins.com. We have better news regarding the wildfires in California and the West in general. They are not entirely extinguished. And in fact, the Bobcat Fire in Southern California, it's in Los Angeles County, didn't grow too much over the weekend. But it is now one of the largest in L.A. County history and in California history, and it's only 15% contained. Similar numbers for the North Complex Fire. That's Mendocino and neighboring counties here in the north part of the state. And the last time I heard, the containment numbers were below 30%. But it's mostly uh, forest land, and there have been very few losses of structures, and uh, no humans have died, to my knowledge, in that fire. We now have 19,000 firefighters here in California fighting more than two dozen major fires. In Oregon, the picture is improving a little bit. Firefighters continue to make progress, increasing containment of the Riverside Fire in Clackamas County to 25 percent and the blaze near Lincoln City to 90 percent. Only three wildfires grew more than 1,000 acres. From Sunday to Monday, six of Oregon's most prominent blazes did not expand. Air quality throughout much of the state is good or moderate. And as I did the other day, let me just give you this kind of helicopter view. These are all in Oregon, in, in Bretagne County. I hope I'm saying that right. Containment of the Lake County fire is 52%. The Slater fire, that's near the California border. 150,000 acres burned, 18% containment. The Archie Creek fire northeast of Roseburg is getting better. That's a 41% containment number. The Lion's Head fire. 200,000 acres, 13% containment. Beachy Creek, one of the first fires that started in Oregon, is at uh, almost 200,000 acres, 38% containment. So these are improving numbers. The Riverside Fire, 137,000 acres, 25% containment. The Holiday Farm Fire, that's east of Eugene, 173,000 acres, 14% containment. And the South Obenchain Fire in Jackson County is at 65% containment on a 32,000-acre burn. So that is better news, and I hope we continue to see things get better. I see a forecast for rain almost every day in uh, the Seattle area of Washington, and I hope that's widespread and helps uh, douse the fires that continue in Washington state. So Trump administration officials have identified Portland, Seattle, and New York City as permitting ongoing violence, failing to counteract crime, and the implicit threat is that they're going to cut federal spending, which they often do. So, for example, the indictment of Portland, they marked 100 consecutive nights of protest marred by vandalism, chaos, and even killing. Well... Most of that protesting took place in a two- or three-block area, and there was vandalism. There were isolated incidences of killing. 
But the impression they try to gin up here is that the whole city is on fire and out of control. In the midst of this violence, the Portland City Council cut $15 million from the police bureau, eliminating 84 positions. Crucially, the cuts include the gun violence reduction team. So this is part of Trump's continuing effort to press the law and order button to make it seem like Democrat-run cities and states are melting down, breaking down. And it's just more bullshit that he uses to feed his voters. I skipped any adjectives there. (laughs) And uh, the Oregonian newspaper reports that the protesters did take a week-long break while the city was blanketed with heavy smoke from the wildfires. They resumed protests on Friday night. On Saturday night, about 200 demonstrators marched through downtown Portland. They uh, broke some windows. But beyond that, the demonstrations were peaceful. The police did not uh, use any munitions or extraordinary methods. In Louisiana, federal authorities have opened a civil rights investigation, and a Louisiana state uh, police trooper has been placed on leave as new questions have surfaced about the death of a black man after a high-speed chase in northern Louisiana last year. Ronald Green was stopped after uh, he ran from the police. There was a high-speed chase. And his family members were initially told that he died from injuries that he sustained in a crash. But new photos have recently surfaced, show that his face was bruised and bloodied. Damage to his car is inconsistent with a fatal accident. We're now told that Tasers were discharged at least three times on him as he was being uh, uh, physically restrained, and he died of cardiac arrest. So we'll see where that investigation leads. A couple of quickies on Trump and some of his bizarre moves. Over the weekend, he announced $13 billion worth of paper towels and uh, money to fund a replacement of the electrical grid in Puerto Rico. Now, this has been on hold for almost three years since the devastation of Hurricane Maria. At one point, Trump asked his aides if we could sell Puerto Rico. And his personal pettiness is really defined by this, and he now thinks that he's going to be a hero on the island. And he boasted on Friday when he announced the release of the money, I'm the best thing that ever happened to Puerto Rico. No one even close. Now, that, it makes you want to hurl, because it's nowhere near the truth. And it attempts to disguise deep cruelty in pursuit of partisan politics by this petty man. All right. He also ordered that as of yesterday, WeChat, which is the online texting system, It's used by many Chinese Americans and relatives in China. I know people who do business in China. They say WeChat is where you go to connect with your colleagues and contacts. Well, a federal judge here in San Francisco issued an injunction banning the ban on WeChat. So it is operating for now. The judge said that uh, the logic for the ban was uh, not very coherent. She raised serious questions about whether uh, it would harm First Amendment rights and it placed significant hardship on the plaintiffs. Then there's TikTok, which was uh, banned in the same executive order. But now there is a deal that Trump has, quote unquote, given his blessing to. Until, of course, throwing a (laughs) curveball after making that statement. So this is really complicated and uh, not very clear. But even the New York Times concedes exactly who would control the new entity of TikTok remains unclear. It's a partnership that includes Oracle and Walmart. Neither company has any experience with a social media app like this. So ByteDance, which is the Chinese-based company that invented TikTok, would hold an 80% stake in TikTok Global. 
But because ByteDance is partly owned by non-Chinese investors, those investors would become indirect owners of TikTok Global, bumping up the U.S. ownership stake and allowing the Trump administration to claim that the majority of the company is owned by Americans. Huh? All right, so let's just assume that'll figure itself out. But on Saturday, Trump renewed his demand for a cut, just like any good mobster would. He said the deal would involve about a $5 billion contribution toward education. He said, we're going to be setting up a very large fund for the education of American youths. That's the pro-white history plan that he announced earlier this week, or it was last week, I'm sorry. And everybody says, huh? We didn't agree to any $5 billion kickback. And likewise... The Trump White House had negotiated a deal with the big pharmaceutical companies to cut drug prices. And then at the last minute, Mark Meadows, the White House chief of staff, insisted that drug makers pay for a $100 cash gift card that would be mailed to seniors before November. And some of the industry people dubbed them Trump cards. The White House said, well, you know, his name's not going to be on it. But even the corrupt people who run Big Pharma (laughs) said they're worried about the optics of having the chief executives of the country's leading pharmaceutical makers stand with the president in the Rose Garden as he hoisted an oversized card and gloated about helping a crucial block of voters. The VP of uh, Public Affairs at Pharma, Priscilla Vanderveer, quote, We could not agree to the administration's plan to issue one-time savings cards right before a presidential election. (laughs) Even they can tell when it stinks. Kudos to Aaron Maté, who has been doing the most clear-headed reporting about Russiagate. He's had time now to do a deep dive into the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence report that was issued August 18th. And he basically says, look, they conclude that there's substantial evidence that Konstantin Kalimnik, who was a partner of Paul Manafort, was a Russian spy. And a careful reading of the report indicates that they have no concrete evidence, that they've gone further than the Mueller report, and the Mueller report could not substantiate the claim that Kalimnik is a Russian agent. Matei points out that he actually is pro-Ukraine and that he and Manafort were trying to steer the politics to move Ukraine toward the European community and the United States and away from Moscow. And I've argued that for a long time. This is one of the most significant, ignorant misreadings of the whole Russiagate scam. And yes, Paul Manafort owed money to Russian Russian oligarchs. But he operated in Ukraine. And the claim that he passed polling information to Klimnik that somehow informed the Russian meddling in the 2016 election? Well, that doesn't hold water either. And uh, follow the link in the show file to read Aaron Maté's report. Maté was also a big fan of Stephen F. Cohen. He was the eminent historian and Russophile who held unpopular views about the Bolshevik Revolution, Stalin and Lenin. Oh, yeah, in Russiagate. He taught at Princeton and at New York University. He wrote 10 books. His wife, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, is publisher and part owner of The Nation, where he was frequently published. And I heard him uh, often on a radio show hosted by a guy who I think is a conservative, John Bachelor. But Bachelor is a student of international affairs and gave a weekly forum to Cohen and let him express himself. And to me, that's the best kind of radio and media that you can have. And I uh, requested several interviews with Professor Cohen over the the years, but uh, never got to talk to him. And I honor him at his passing. Here's today's COVID-19 update, edited by Linda Lewis. As of today, the international death toll is just short of of, uh, one million. And the American death toll is very close to 200,000. It's at 199,525. 
And in the past week, the hotspots where new single-day coronavirus case records have been established are West Virginia, Wyoming, North Dakota, Nebraska, Oregon, Utah, and Wisconsin. Wisconsin has reported over 2,000 new COVID-19 infections for three days straight. The spike corresponds with a 300% rise in confirmed cases in 18 to 24-year-olds. Similarly, in Utah, the spike is driven by 15 to 24-year-olds. Could that be those returning to university and partying at the frat house? In New Zealand, they've announced for the second time that domestic restrictions will be lifted. There have been single-digit or zero domestic cases in New Zealand's capital, Auckland, since the government reintroduced restrictions. Now, on Friday, we reported to you about the machinations at the CDC, where the scientists had been uh, uh, rebuffed and bypassed by the political appointees and various guidance related to uh, the coronavirus has been posted and taken down and posted again, modified. (laughs) So it is kind of confusing. The CDC updated the guidance on on its website to say that COVID can be spread through the air after previously saying it is mainly transmitted through interpersonal contact. A draft version of proposed changes to these recommendations was posted in error, said the Health and Human Services Department. CDC is currently updating its recommendations regarding airborne transmission, transmission, sorry. And as of today, the CDC is saying it's reverting to the previous guidance. And what this means is that it's obvious that there is political interference. As we look at the slowdown in testing, we look at the way reporting is being filtered, delayed, we can't have any confidence in the data that we're getting. And this is deeply frustrating because the collection of that data has been problematic from the get-go. And to further clamp down, HHS Secretary Alex Azar, a loyal Trumpist, issued a statement saying that he must sign off on any new regulation changes, including those at the Food and Drug Administration. The New York Times says outside observers were alarmed by the new memo, worried that it could contribute to a public perception of political meddling in science-based regulatory decisions. Trump announced on Friday a pledge of 100 million vaccine doses by the end of the year. And this is just more blue sky, more confusion. Because, of course, you can have a million doses. You can have 100 million doses. But if nobody trusts the vaccine and is not willing to roll up their sleeves or take an oral dose of it, then it's a waste. So... The president said we essentially have it. We'll be announcing it fairly soon. But the testing protocols for the two vaccines furthest along in the trials, those of Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech, show that analysis of the data will likely stretch into December or early next year. And Trump is saying that everything's good. We're going to put this behind us. But now there are seven states that have said, wait a minute, we're skeptical about the federal reviews of these vaccines. California, Colorado, the District of Columbia, Michigan, New York, Oregon, and West Virginia said they'll only administer a vaccine that completed clinical trials and an outside committee's review. And those are the blue states that trouble Trump so much because he says, you know, if we didn't have to count the blue states... Our numbers would be really good. (laughs) I mean, that is so pathetic. This is the guy, you know, we talked about his cheating. This is just another way to cheat. Just pretend that the blue states don't exist. They're not part of Trump's America. We're just inconvenient (laughs) hitchhikers on the Trump Express. And I don't know about you, but I've been wary about getting on an airplane at this point. The CDC is offering more confusing 
information. They found that 11,000 people were exposed to the coronavirus on flights. But they didn't confirm if any of those led to infections, hospitalizations, or deaths. The CDC has not confirmed such transmissions domestically. New studies of flights in Asia and Europe have identified instances where scientists think the virus has spread on commercial flights. Well, I don't find that very helpful or reliable. I'm not going to get on a plane and breathe recycled air and be jammed in with strangers unless I have a little bit more solid information. At the United Nations, they're observing the 75th anniversary of the founding of the organization. It's a virtual assembly because of COVID-19. And uh, all of the world leaders are speaking remotely. Trump was invited, but apparently uh, either declined or just rudely stiffed the United Nations. And the Secretary General said, The U.N. is marking its 75th anniversary at a time of great disruption for the world, uh, compounded by an unprecedented global health crisis. Will we emerge stronger and better equipped to work together, or will distrust and isolation grow further? Well, the United States is further isolated from the U.N. and from the other nations that signed on to the Iranian nuclear agreement. Because over the weekend... Over the strenuous objection of those allies, the United States reimposed the sanctions against Iran. Mike Pompeo says this will make the world safer. (laughs) But Britain, France, and Germany said in a letter that the sanctions would have no legal effect. To underscore their opposition, the letter said all three countries would work to preserve the 2015 agreement, which they jointly negotiated with the U.S., China, and Russia. Even as Washington sought to destroy its last remnants, this is thought to be a way to put spikes in the road in case a Biden administration wants to renew that agreement. Trump has announced uh, he didn't actually do it, but the Central Command over the weekend said that we have added 100 troops and additional armored vehicles into eastern Syria after a number of recent clashes with Russian forces there. There is no mission. There is no basis for the U.S. deployment. And Trump's claim that uh, we're going to steal their oil is ridiculous, and we know it. Finally today, there is a new leak, an international leak, of financial documents that show that the biggest global banks are the biggest money launderers of criminal cash. The leak focuses on more than 2,000 suspicious activity reports that were filed with the U.S. government's FinCEN, that's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And what it shows is stuff that you won't find surprising. A billion dollars in wire transfers by J.P. Morgan Chase that the bank later came to suspect were linked to an alleged Russian organized crime boss. Now, J.P. Morgan... uh, Oh, here's another one. The British bank, HSBC, allowed a group of criminals to transfer millions of dollars from a Ponzi scheme through its accounts. And so, while this is news, it's not new. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast all the way to the end here. You'll find it on YouTube. You can share it with absolutely everyone. And I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again Happy trails